I'm just wondering, how much confidence do you have in these vaccines? Personally, if the data has been reviewed by a stringent national regulatory authority like the US FDA or the MHRA in the UK or EMA and passes their regulatory scrutiny for safety and efficacy, then at least over the short term that we've been able to observe these vaccines, they are safe uh, for use in, in people. Will I take a vaccine? When my priority time comes up and, and it's offered to me, I will take a vaccine. How will Asia react? What will Asia do? Will it wait for the U.S.? Will it wait for the EU? How do you see the response from the region? So I think the first um, organization or country in Asia that you should consider is China, because it has its own regulatory agency. And at least two com Chinese companies have submitted their uh, regulatory dossiers to the NMPA for approval. So that approval is expected shortly. Uh, what the actual data are, we don't know yet, but presumably data on safety and efficacy for some period of time, probably short of a year or, or even short of six months. Um, and, and that will be potentially one of the biggest um, uh, opportunities to learn what the Chinese data actually are, because there are a number of countries now in Asia uh, that have signed contracts uh, with Chinese companies. So that's a, a big question. Japan, Korea, uh, other advanced economies are looking uh, to the Western uh, vaccine companies. And, and as early as this morning, a number of different um, contracts or opportunities were announced uh, by the Korean government. So uh, there is a commitment to vaccinating people in Asia. Uh, we're not sure, or I'm not sure personally, when the vaccines will be here. Um, but there is still uh, progress afoot. Jerome, what about these efficacy, the efficacy of these uh, vaccines, we know Moderna and, and indeed the Pfizer one, we're talking about 95% or, or thereabout, that's the figure which has been banded about AstraZeneca, so I think it's significantly less than that, but it has a different way of actually attacking the, or actually protecting you, I should say. So, you know, the thing is, what about the long-term uh, side effects? Because we've had no time to actually examine that, especially with the mRNA versions and the former two. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, over the period of the two and a half or two roughly months of observation, we can be reasonably assured of safety and efficacy. So that means that, you know, the efficacy of the Pfizer vaccine is 95 percent, 94 percent efficacy in over 65 year old people. Um, the Moderna vaccine, 94.5. The question of long-term safety is an important one, and it gets to a real question around vaccines in general. You know, generally, the, the side effects that are most common occur in the first two weeks. The infrequent side effects occur within the first two months. That's probably why the US FDA picked that time frame for emergency use authorization. Beyond that, you know, we often have very, very rare complications that only come up after hundreds of thousands or millions of people are vaccinated. And that will be really dependent on the ability of countries and companies to follow people who've been vaccinated and to accurately report back uh, safety information ar around these vaccines. When you balance that against the, the current surge in the pandemic in the United States and Europe and, and, and countries in, in Asia, uh, you really have to consider a balance of safety versus protection of the population against the disease that we know uh, has dreadful consequences in the elderly. Uh, Jerome, th that's it. I mean, the mRNA-based uh, vaccines, that they're, well, they're new, so we don't know. They're completely quite different to the traditional ones, which, um, you know, for instance, AstraZeneca have gone down the traditional path. Uh, tell me, I mean, if you had to choose between what, the AstraZeneca or Moderna or Pfizer, which one would you take? At this, at this point, you know, I, I would depend on uh, data that we haven't seen yet. Um, so I'm assuming that the regulatory review, for instance, the FDA is meeting this week and next week uh, to look at the Pfizer and Moderna uh, vaccines. I would really uh, put a lot of trust in, in their analysis of, of safety and efficacy data. The AstraZeneca data are interesting because they had 90% efficacy with a regimen that was a half dose by, followed by a full dose and 60% efficacy of, of two full doses given at least a month apart. There are some questions around those um, that trial 
that I think still need to be answered, and, and none of us have seen the actual data and or how they, they came to those conclusions. So I have a few more questions around the AstraZeneca data. Remember that the US FDA and the World Health Organization used a vaccine efficacy of 50% as the threshold, and all of these vaccines pass that threshold. The real, the really important point here is that we really need to see those data. Right now we have press releases. And so, you know, with AstraZeneca, one of the main uh, interesting things is that, is that it may actually prevent asymptomatic infection. And when you're thinking about protection of populations from hospitalization and from death, prevention of asymptomatic infection is actually a really critical feature. And you know, some of the other vaccine trials are not designed to look at that. So we may get a very, very important information out of AstraZeneca, even with its efficacy of 60%. It may be a very valuable vaccine. Jerome, you talk about relying on data, that regulators will look at the data available. How good is the data out there? Yeah, so that's actually, and it's a difficult question because when, when the companies are reporting back, they're reporting on a number of infections in, you know, 20, 30, 40,000 people. And people look at it and say, well, that's only 90 infections out of, but that actually re represents 90 infections occurring in two months. So if you look at a yearly attack rate, the yearly attack rate is very high. So actually the vaccine in protecting against infection is actually doing a remarkably good job up to two months. Now, will those responses deteriorate with time? Possibly. I mean, most immune responses are strongest right after you vaccinate and then get weaker over time. But we really don't know the six month or 12 month uh, data on efficacy, and that's really important. Around the long-term consequences, you know, RNA vaccines have been tested in humans uh, for many years. And, and so far, there haven't been a lot of um, long-term uh, side effects that have been reported with the other RNA vaccines made by Moderna, made by CureVac. Um, so there is a fair amount of confidence in the platform. Now, could there be specific issues? Possibly. Um, but really, what, it, what does an RNA vaccine do? Instead of using uh, a protein, the RNA itself is translated into a protein um, con uh, containing the spike part of the COVID vaccine uh, virus, and it induces an immune response. So it's actually doing exactly the same thing that a regular vac that a protein vaccine does or a whole inactivated vaccine does, uh, just taking it at a bit earlier step. So, so Jerome. Okay, that's the way that these ones are operating. What about others like uh, the ones which uh, the, the Russians have? They claim 92% uh, efficacy. I think it's called uh, Gamaleya. And we've also got the Chinese one, a Sinopharm. How, what's your take on those two? So it's a little harder to interpret those. Um, we're not as familiar with their regulatory systems and the rules that they operate under. Um, for Gamaleya, for instance, is an adenovirus-based vaccine. Remember that the AstraZeneca slash Oxford vaccine is also an adenovirus-based vaccine. We know that adenovirus-based vaccines can generate uh, appropriate protective or immune responses. So it's feasible that the, gam the Gamaleya vaccine is protecting. They issued their protection information with fewer numbers of infections. Um, so there may be less robustness around their estimate of protective effect, efficacy. Um, so just some questions there, and it would be, again, great to see the data. Sinopharm is, is interesting, and, and as, as is Sinovac, another Chinese company. Both of them have what we call whole inactivated vaccines. So what they did was they grew up the virus, and they killed it. And they mixed it with a substance called alum, which makes the immune responses stronger. And those, respond, those vaccines generate um, very nice responses in, in humans who get the vaccine. Now, are they protective? We don't know. And, and we're really waiting to, to see and hear about how protective the Sinopharm and Sinovac vaccines actually are and what their safety profiles are. Now, based on what we know about whole inactivated vaccines, we don't anticipate much in the way of um, really significant side effects. Um, but again, it would be, it's really important to actually see their data and talk to them about it and, and understand uh, how much protection was seen in what populations. Did they vaccinate older people? You know, all of these things are going to be critical as we roll out vaccines.